Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis. This week, Real Foot Forward is made possible by our friends at CrossFit Auto Body, located in Union City. CrossFit Auto Body is the perfect place to begin your fitness journey. Come in and become part of the CrossFit community. Visit uccrossfitautobody.com for more information. On today's episode, Scott sits down with ag professionals and students who are visiting Discovery Park of America during Tennessee's Ag Literacy Week. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast recorded every single week here in beautiful West Tennessee. Today, we've got an extra special treat for you on this episode. We had more than 900 students and a lot of our agriculture partners here at Discovery Park of America to talk agriculture. I hope you enjoyed hearing this special episode as much as we enjoyed recording it. So I've got with me here today, Wes Totten. Well, I work for the University of Tennessee at Martin and I started there in 2007. Uh, I'm a plant and soil scientist by trade, so I teach plant and soil science classes, uh, specifically those related to turf grass and ornamental horticulture. And then I also, about uh, five years ago, um, started the department chair role at, at Martin in, uh, in the Department of Ag Geosciences and Natural Resources. So oh, congratulations. Teach and, teach and chair the department. Yes, sir. So what, what was your background? Where did you uh, come from? Well, I'm originally from North Alabama, Athens, Alabama, and uh, uh, did an undergraduate degree at Auburn University in agronomy and soils and uh, went on there for a master's degree at Auburn as well in horticulture and then finished up uh, at Clemson with a, with a Ph.D. In, um, in turf grass management. Oh, that's interesting. What, what uh, pushed you into that area of study? That's not something that a lot of folks may instantly think of when they think about going to college. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I, I kind of I grew up on a golf course. I played a lot of golf in, uh, as a child and in high school and uh, was dead set on going to the University of Alabama. Don't hold that against me <laughs> uh, for an undergraduate degree, but ended up taking a trip to Auburn University with my dad, fell in love with it. I found out that you could earn a degree uh, growing turf grass uh, in a football stadium or golf course or baseball field, and uh, I never looked back. What, what do you think most uh, folks don't know about grass and turf and agriculture what you're right in the thick of it what are some of the uh, misunderstandings or things people don't know well it's not as easy as you think it is it's uh, it's not as simple as just throwing some seed on the ground and uh, and having instant grass pop up the next day there's a lot of science behind it and people expect a lot out of their landscapes and including turf grass these days uh, um, color wise density wise um, they expect a lot of color and pop in their in their landscape so uh, to get to, to meet the expectations of people these days it takes a four-year degree to get the plants to do what people want them to do these days and what about somebody like me um, I do my four-year degree is in journalism mm-hmm. and that doesn't come in real handy uh, when it comes to planting my shrubs and my you know and my wife and I we have this constant uh, challenge that she keeps wanting to not pay attention to the tag that says sun or not sun or shade or she's like let's just try and see if this one will work yes, i've found they do not work you really do have to pay attention to you know what 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 advice do you have for folks like me well you're very fortunate living in northwest tennessee to be surrounded by a really tight-knit ag community we've got a lot of resources um i have people take or audit classes all the time from the general public at, at martin and uh also uh you've got a, a great master gardener uh network in this in this oh, area with the northwest northwest tennessee master gardener society they do training sessions i believe every other year oh wow is when they do the training sessions okay um i'll do a botany class with them typically when when the, when they ask and do a turf grass session when they ask and uh we've also got a great network work of extension agents as well that are very knowledgeable one actually right behind us 
uh, with, re with respect to Mr. Jeff Lanham. So you've got a great network of educational resources to take advantage of and get questions answered. Okay, well, you've given me something to, to dive into for, for next year. Absolutely. So we're here today at Discovery Park. It's Tennessee Agriculture mm -hmm. Day. Um, what did you bring with us at your table today? Well, in, in our department, uh, we're Department of Agriculture, Geosciences, and Natural Resources, we decided to bring some plant and soil science materials um, or agronomy-related materials. Dr. Derek and her student workers, uh, who are actually students uh, taking classes in our department, one of them fixing to graduate, um, they're doing some plan as well as soil demonstration. Uh, also, one of our premier programs in the, in the department is our veterinary health technology uh, program. So we essentially train young people to be what would be equivalent in the, in the human world as uh, um, RNs or registered nurses mm -hmm. for, for uh, um, veterinarians. Uh, veterinarians are looking to hire um, assistants with four-year degrees and, and degrees in veterinary health technology. So I brought some animal demonstrations uh, with me today uh, to show the students how we teach young people to become essentially a nurse for a veterinarian. Yeah, and that's one of the first things that I saw when I when I came in here and yes, it sir. inspired me to tell you my big long story yes, of how I got my dog. So uh, I know kids are going to jump on that well, and uh, have so. a blast. I hope so. We love our animals. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Get very attached very quickly. Well, thanks for coming here today. It was great to meet you. God bless you. It was great to meet you as well. Thank you so much. And now I've got Josh Richardson here with me. Welcome, Josh. Thanks, Scott. So tell me a little bit about what you do. Scott, I work for part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture for an agency called the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Uh, some of your listeners may recall the Soil Conservation Service or the Soil Erosion Service. We're we have uh, uh, morphed into an agency that looks at a broad suite of resource concerns on private lands in the United States. So here uh, locally in West Tennessee, we have field offices in every county uh, that service our uh, agriculture, forestry, uh, landowners. And so I, it's my pleasure to work with those folks. So tell me a little bit about how you uh, got into uh, that field. Did you grow up knowing that's exactly what you wanted to do? I would like to say that I had a great master plan like every other young man, right? But I didn't. I did not either. <laughs> I, t I got my start in uh, agriculture at home uh, with uh, livestock and putting up hay and cutting tobacco. I grew up in Henry County, Tennessee, right down the road from Discovery Park here. Had a very strong FFA uh, advisor as a young man who, who really uh, did a lot to steer me in the right direction. Went to school right here at UT Martin and got a degree in natural resource management and was lucky enough to go on a graduate school and, and eventually get hired on by Natural Resource Conservation Service and have found it to be a good fit the last 12 or so years for me and my family. What, what, do, you, what do you think a lot of people out there who aren't uh, surrounded by agriculture or um, things like that like we are, what, what do you think they don't know? What are some of the misunderstandings about about agriculture and about conservation and the things that you do? So, Scott, but the my customers, the people we get to deal with, care. They care a lot about their land. They care a lot about their communities. They care about their families. They care about the environment. And I think public perception outside of rural America tells or tries to, to tell a, a different story and the narrative is that agriculture is ruining the environment, is uh, only cares about making money, uh, are horrible stewards of the land, are mean to their animals, and you know that old saying, "One apple, ruin, one bad apple ruins the barrel," and the, and so we get one bad story. And and there are people out there that that make some poor choices. But I've had the opportunity to work in three different states for the agency: uh, Indiana, Kentucky, and Tennessee. And in all three states, I've encountered people uh, that were genuine, honest, hardworking, uh, would give you the shirt off their back. And uh, I don't think we see that narrative uh, portrayed accurately, you know. Yeah, I hear from a lot of folks in agriculture who say, you know, look, this is our livelihood. Why wouldn't we want to protect it as, as best we can and, and use sustainable practices? And um, so, yeah, so I do, I do hear that a lot. What, how are some ways or are there ways that folks in the agriculture community can change the narrative and get more facts out there into the world? You know, things like you're doing right here today, Scott, uh, getting the young people involved, getting the community involved, 
um, getting your local politicians involved and, and making sure that we're educating folks with factual information, um, and getting more kids out on the farm to see what's really there. You can learn a lot of things uh, from a walk in the pasture about biology, uh, microorganisms, plant growth, photosynthesis. Um, you know, the outdoors is our, the out, outside outdoors is our original classroom before we had school buildings and, and everything else. Uh, uh, humans, we learned outside. We learned by doing, by touching, by smelling, by tasting, and uh, get the kids out. And I, I think that'll do more than anything. Um, I don't know how much they grow behind uh, the Xbox. <laughs> yeah, no, that's exactly right. It's exactly right. So, so if you if if uh, anyone's out there who's listening, who's got some young kids, they live in the city, but yet they want to teach their kids more about agriculture. What what are your thoughts on some suggestions? So, so our agency is primarily looking at you know uh, private landowners. You know, every community that I've ever been uh, able to work in has a, a 4-H program. Um, most of them have some sort of high school agricultural program. Um, they all have farmers. Yes, they do. <laughs> and I'll tell you, uh, if they just went out and asked their neighbor, uh, uh, there's a lot of, of farmers that would love the opportunity to meet a young family and show them what they do, um, have them come look at the farm. So I would, the first thing I would do is encourage people just to ask. <laughs> yeah, that's great. You know, if it's something you love, don't you want to share it? And these folks love the land and they love their farm. They want to share it. If you love bass fishing, you want to tell people about your bass fishing. Or, or if you love stamp collecting, you know. So if you love farming, you want to tell people. Yeah. Uh, well, so go so go ask. Well, I know there's going to be about 900 kids today. So, oh, wow. So thank you for being here today to help, help get the word out and, and help uh, plant the seed of agriculture in some of these young minds. It's been our pleasure. Thank you. And now I'm here with Beth Cochran. Welcome, Beth. Thanks. Tell me a little bit about what you do here in Union City. Well, I work for the Obine County Soil Conservation District here in Union City. Uh, I've been here for about a year and a half, uh, but I've been in the agriculture business with my husband and my dad and all for about, oh, my whole life. Well, so so let tell me about that. What was, you, I'm assuming, was your dad a farmer? My dad was a row crop farmer. He, they did have pigs and some, but mainly a row crop farmer for up until like 80, 84, 85. And um, so you grew up, to what, what's it like to grow up grow up in a farmer's oh. family? Because a lot of people listening mm -hmm. have never, some of them have never been on a farm. Oh, it's wonderful. We, uh, of course, we live in a farmhouse. Uh, my mom helped up until, I've got a, there's four of us in the household, uh, ranging from uh, my youngest sister's 10 years younger than me. So we had a, we were all, we were spread out and we all kind of did our thing. I, you know, we tromp cotton, <laughs> you know, they don't even know what that is anymore. But I can remember us getting out tromping cotton in the old um, trailers out there. And uh, how, how many, how many acres? Oh, dad probably farmed probably six, seven hundred, him and his brother. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. So you went out there and actually chopped mm -hmm. cotton. Well, I didn't chop the cotton. No, I didn't. I didn't get that blessing. But we did. Uh, we did chop cotton whenever they would dump it in the uh, trailers and, and stuff. And what, what is that process? Tell well, me what that's like. Well, they just whenever at that point when they picked the cotton, they would just dump a cotton in a big uh, trailer and then you would have to get in there. we get in there and tromp it down to pack it down so they could get more in it, which now <laughs> they have modules. So, you yeah. know, you, the, the combine actually just kicks these modules out. I mean, the cotton picker actually kicks the modules out. But we, uh, we you know, we didn't, we didn't get it to that process because Dad, like I said, got out of farm in 84, 85. And um, he, from that point, he sold equipment, and then he got into uh, hunting and he owned a, he just, this year's the first year that he hadn't done his hunting preserve. He had a hunting preserve called Grassy Creek where he did quail. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, he had people from all over. He would just, he would put out quail and he had people that come and paid to hunt them. And then, so he did that for about 25 years, I guess. 
And then you're somebody who didn't, you didn't leave and go to the big city. No. You married a yeah. farmer. Actually, it's kind of ironic. A lot of people laugh about it because my husband and my mother worked together. They worked together for 38 years. They, uh, at the uh, local grain company, um, they, my husband went to work there out of high school. He was a fertilized truck driver. They did retail, you know, plus they would do the fertilize. They would do the grain. Uh, they would buy the grain. They'd sell it, and then they'd turn around and buy it back from the farmers. Oh. They did the whole shoot and match. Uh-huh. About four years, four years ago, they got out of the retail business, but my mom and he, he worked himself up in the business. Now he uh, is the manager of the place, and uh, we, were, we were fortunate enough to be able to buy into some stock into it and it's owned by a group of farmers it's not a big it's not a big corporation business it's it's local it's owned by local people and uh my mom has done his bookkeeping for like i said they've done it for 35 years together she's getting ready to retire maybe next year (laughs) maybe but uh so it's a family business well yeah it kind of is but but uh my it uh it's not owned by the family, but everybody thinks we own it. But we don't because it's always been. I've got three sons, and all three of them grew up working there. Oh, uh, my brother worked for them. Of the of the three sons, um, are any going into agriculture? Well, it's ironic. My oldest son worked there probably more than any of them, uh, and he worked up there. He worked there up until two years ago. He's he he graduated from UT Martin with an ag business degree. And then he went on and got his master's in ag resource management. And he worked there till about two, two and a half, three years ago. And then he went to work for uh, a company by the name of Trimble, who does uh, a lot of GPS work and that kind of thing. And then, but now, within this past year, he's opened his own business doing precision ag. Oh. Uh, he's partnered with some people and he does precision ag management for farmers. Hey. Now, now, for somebody who doesn't know what precision ag is, can you give us a top well, overview? Well, they they just kind of go meet with your far, meet with their farmers, and um, they once they meet with the farmers, they uh, they do a lot, keep up with a lot of their chemicals. They soil sample for them to let them know what nutrients they need in their um, management of of their land. You know what they need, so they do a lot of management of the land, nutrient management, and if then keep up with all the records if if um, some EPA or somebody comes in and says hey you shouldn't have sprayed this here you know he can help them with pulling up all the records of what they sprayed where and just kind of keeping up with that kind of thing that's probably what a lot of people who don't farm don't realize is Um, how much goes into farming today well the thing is these days it's so much of um, everything is technology well you've got all your old farmers that they get on a piece of equipment and they roll. Well, now everything is technology based. Well, you know, a lot of them don't want to know that technology base. Mm-hmm. So they have people like Kurt, my son, that come in and help them program that kind of stuff. So when they get in a combine and they're shelling corn, they can tell exactly how much, uh, how, how, what moisture is as they're going down the row, or mm-hmm. what what the moisture is on the corn, what it's averaging the yields on it, and everything by a monitor that they keep in their equipment now. Yeah, that's incredible, isn't it? It's crazy. Now, it's how about crazy. the other two sons? My uh, middle son, he worked up there, but he uh, he when he gra- he graduated from UTM, but he went to seminary in Louisville, and uh, he's married and got a little. Boy, and they live in. He now lives in Indianapolis. He he's uh, in the ministry and works and works at a church in Indianapolis. Okay. And then my youngest just graduated this past May from UT Martin with an ag business degree, and he's actually on board now with my husband. That it, them two kind of running the show. <laughs> so you're you're making a major contribution to the world of agriculture. Yeah, yeah. I've <laughs> I've, I've, I've lived it my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Well, thank you for being here today yeah. talking to all these kids. I know mm-hmm. that they're going to love talking with you. Well, I appreciate it.
So I've got Derek Giffen here from Giffen Farms wearing his Giffen Farms hat. I'm going to have to get one of those. I'll look you up. Um, thanks for being here today. Thank you all for the opportunity. Tell, tell, tell our listeners a little bit about, about what you do at Giffen Farms. We're a family farm based here out of Union City, Tennessee. And I'm the fifth generation on the farm. I farm with my dad and my cousin. And so you, you, do you, are you living in the same, uh, on the same farm you grew up on? Sure are. That's yeah. amazing, isn't it? Yeah, my wife calls it the village. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. so you've got a whole bunch of uh, <laughs> we all, family all around. Yeah, kind of within like two miles. But yeah. So, so, so uh, because I um, personally have benefited um, from one of your boxes of beef, Sure. Um, that um, we're going to eat some of for Thanksgiving. So awesome. thank you for that. Thank you. Um, talk to me, and and also I want to note that it was a super easy ordering process, and I ordered it online. You know, it was just you guys are set up like super, and your your uh, talented wife is a great blogger, and you know, get social media user, and thank you. so so. But start off at the beginning. What 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 goes into raising you know from the calves all the way up to coming to my house how does that happen sure so um we start off with like a cow calf setup so that means we have a mature mother cow that produces a calf and we grow that calf to 500 pounds or about six months old and we, how long does that take uh about six months okay. to, to grow the calf you know she'll carry the calf for nine months but um after that we'll wean the calf and that's kind of where the row crops come into play too so we'll wean that calf and we grow a cover crop, so which is a kind of a winter crop after row crops. I know I'm saying crop a lot, but uh, so we'll harvest corn, plant wheat behind that, turn that weaned calf out on wheat to graze all winter. Mm. We'll grow that calf to probably 900 pounds. Wow. And we'll then grain feed that calf for another 120 days. So. About a 1,200 pound steer is what we're looking for. And we'll process that steer, um, get it you know, processed into steaks, ground beef, roast, that kind of thing. Have it packaged. Um, then we'll put boxes together and that kind of stuff and then ship it out like that. How many people are involved? Like if you looked at, the, how many people work on the whole entire farm, everybody? Um, we do have some seasonal help, but uh, total people involved is probably Around six or so. Okay. Wow. And um, your uh, wife, uh, wh- where did you uh, meet your wife? So I went to UT Martin, got an ag, business, or ag science degree, met her over there. She had an ag business degree, but we met her, I met her over at college. And, and so she also was, uh, did she grow up on a farm as well? Yep. Yep. So she's from Southeast Missouri, uh, grew up on a small cow-calf operation, and that's kind of where She's come in to play on our place, uh, has really brought all of her knowledge with her, and has been a very, very important part for our operation. So, so. she clearly does a lot more than just social media. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's the uh, cow manager, I call her. So. Okay, okay. <laughs> yep. And uh, about how many cows a year uh, do you guys uh, take from beginning to end? Um, the process will be from in that 10 to 20 range, and that's just for, you know, local beef that's done up in the cuts and that kind of thing. But um, we don't process every every calf or every steer. Uh, we'll sell some of those to other end users, but um, it varies year to year. So totally. when, I, when I bought my box, it said sold out after I bought my yeah. box. Did I get the sure last enough, box? You did. You did. <laughs> Yep. So it's kind of seasonal. Uh, we'll, you know, we'll be fully restocked in May, okay. and that'll run through the summer months. Okay. So I need to put a reminder on my Outlook calendar. Yeah. Now, I know you 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 sometimes go to some farmers markets and mm-hmm. and, and, and sell there as well. So yep. do you have an ordering process where people can sign up and order in advance. Sure do. Yep. Okay. Well, I'll have to do that then this year. Um, what What do you think as as a uh, person who's like very much surrounded by agriculture? What what do you think regular folks who don't uh, know anything about farming or agriculture, what do you think they need to know or they need to understand about what it is that you and other farmers do? So I think a common misconception is we're just out for the dollar. Um, obviously, we need to remain profitable or we won't be in business, but we take care of the land, and that's our main uh, priority. And if we don't do things and treat things well, um, we won't be here. And 
we eat the same products that we sell and we're not going to do something you know just for a dollar to harm that and risk other people's health and I guess livelihood yeah well so. I personally appreciate the work that you do thank you and I know anybody um, anybody out there who uh, appreciates agriculture would appreciate you guys approach and if somebody wanted to check out your blog and your, your photos and everything what's your website www.giffenfarms.com excellent so I advise everybody to check it out and to put their name on the list to uh, order some uh, fresh beef in a box awesome thank you <laughs> thank you so I'm sitting here with Alexis Beach. And Alexis, tell me who, who your friends are here that are with us. Okay, so this is Allie Barker. Hello, and Allie. She's a freshman in high school. Okay. That's Parks Johnson, and he is a senior. Okay, welcome, guys. Um, so you, you <clears throat> all have on the uh, Telltale blue corduroy jacket with the FFA logo. Tell me a little bit about FFA and, and what you do and, and why, why you do it. Well, basically, um, we just represent agriculture at its best, and we go into our community, and we do different stuff that participates to agriculture. Did you grow up um, in working in agriculture? Or? No, sir. I actually discovered my high school year I wanted to pursue in agriculture, but I did not. I've grown up in a family with small animals as far as dogs and stuff like that, and I've showed dogs. So I decided my freshman year that I wanted to change and my career path into agriculture. What's your advice to anyone who's like sixth, seventh, eighth grade, who's uh, coming up in the world and trying to decide whether or not to get involved in FFA? Should they? Yes, definitely. Even if you don't, you're not in an agriculture house or family, you really need to consider it because it's, it is a way of communication. You build a lot of strong friendships, and you make a lot of memories. So I would strongly advise it. Excellent. Very good. Well, you've been an incredible guest today. Thank you so much for, for doing this. I hope you have a great time here today as we celebrate Tennessee agriculture. Yes, sir. Thank you for your time. Thank you. So I have here Carol Reed. Welcome, Carol. Thank you, Scott. So tell me a little bit about what you do. My official title is Executive Director of the Tennessee Corn Promotion Council. I also work with the Tennessee Promotion Board and the Tennessee Corn Growers Association. So I have three sets of bosses that they're all great. They're all farmers uh, because our pro- all of our programs are farmer-led and farmer-funded. Uh, but I've enjoyed working with those. All the, all the board members have just been super. And, and this is not your first rodeo, as they say. You've been in um, agriculture for a long time, right? I have. I grew up on a farm in central Kentucky. That farm still is, is in existence with my brother and uncle at the helm. Uh, doing, it's a grain operation. Then um, I left the farm for a while and did my tour of the big cities. Came back, met my husband actually when we were living in Atlanta and uh, found we had a lot of things in common. Obviously our farming background because he grew up on a farm um, not far from Discovery Park. And we decided that we would move back to his farm for him, or just, or I just moved here, and um, so we've been on this back on this farm for 25 years. Wow, that's yeah. great. We um, we are uh, we are we are not a producer, we are a landlord, but we take a real active interest in our producer and the crops that he and his family are growing for us. I'm also been a member of the Weekly County Farm Bureau. Board of Directors, the only female member, I will add Way to, to that go. list. Yeah, you're yeah. a groundbreaker. <laughs> I guess the best yes. in that glass. Yeah, All right. So, in your in your current job, what exactly do you do? I do. Um, let me back up and just to give you a little history of the Tennessee corn. The Corn Growers Association has been around for numerous years, several years. And back about three or four years ago, a group of the members got together and said it's time that we started a corn checkoff, very similar to the soybean checkoff, the beef checkoffs. There's about five checkoff programs in the state of Tennessee. And after some work with our state legislature, they were able to do that. Um, And in March of this year, we started collecting money uh, from the corn growers 
every time that they sell a bushel of corn at one of the granaries, the local granaries, that granary collects a penny per bushel. Those funds come together for us to use in the form of helping people with uh, maybe some research. UT is always doing uh, our Middle Tennessee State University. We've all got, all the universities are doing research to help find ways to improve production for the farmers, uh, to make them more sustainable. The other thing we want to do is also look for ways to expand markets so that there is more markets to sell corn. We've had a bumper crop year this year, uh, and, and so we want to look for new avenues for a way that we can and find additional markets to sell the corn. The other thing that we're looking at and going to concentrate on is consumer education. There's a concern among the ag community as a whole that today's consumer is very far removed from the farm and really doesn't know where their milk comes from. I just talked to some students here today at this event that they were uh, reading uh, today's Ag, this is Ag Literacy Week, and they were reading a book to kindergartners, kindergartners in one of their schools, and the kindergartners actually thought that their hamburger came from McDonald's. Mm. So, I mean, it's a little young, but that's an example of even in our rural community that is uh, ag-based, we still have people here, students here, that don't know where their food comes from. And we think con- consumer education is an important piece of what we're going to do. And, and, and I believe mm-hmm. in a world where people don't know the facts, they'll believe anything that they read. And so Correct. we're also in a world where anybody can say anything and put it out there on social media. And so there is a real, uh, a real uh, division between people who are producing the food, people who are in it every single day, and people who just go to Walmart and, and buy their food. They have no idea where it comes from. So right. things like, you know, you'll see no GMO labeling on things that wouldn't, you know, be GMO. And people don't even understand what GMO means. Right. They just heard that it's supposedly uh, not good for you. And to this, I don't believe that they've ever found any research that a GMO product, eat, consuming a product that's been grown GMO has caused any health Problems. That's absolutely right. And it's been proven that it doesn't. And we've been eating, you know, genetically modified food for uh, generation upon generation upon generation. People don't understand that. When you, when you fertilize a crop <clears throat> to increase your productivity, in some ways you're modified. Right. So we've had modified, genetically modified uh, crops for many, many years. Right, absolutely. So that's just one example of the uh, information that I think consumers need to get. So let's talk about corn. Um, you know, this area is one of the leading producers of corn, I believe. West Tennessee is the leading producer of corn. Uh, there is some corn grown in East Tennessee. Uh, there is some in Middle Tennessee, but primarily uh, the, the large part of our crop, corn crop is grown here in West Tennessee. And why was it such a good year this year? What what we, we had a great spring. Um, we were able to get the range just right. Temperature was good, so we were able to get a lot of corn in the ground. And then we continued getting the rain here in West Tennessee all through the summer. Of course, we ended up with a dry fall, but most of the corn had already made its ears, and so we'd already made it already made, and uh, we ended up having a great year. Unlike um, some of our states west of here they've had a tough time because it got so wet they couldn't plant and we had a little of that with corn but not a whole lot it's just been perfect growing conditions this year and so corn um corn i know there's still cotton in the fields but corns there is corn's done now right corn's done so corn's the corn done. farmers can get uh, <laughs> they can yeah and most of those yeah they're done as good. far as the corn crops are done good well, is there anything else that you think uh, regular folks need to know about agriculture that, that people that don't, like us, aren't surrounded by it? I use a phrase a lot that the Farm Bureau used, has had in the past, and it says, if you eat, you're involved in agriculture. Mm. And I think we need to let everybody know that, that it's important that they, get, they become involved in agriculture. And Scott, you made a great point in that they look for the facts mm-hmm. and uh, be able to know what's what's what and not what they just hear or see because it may not be factual yeah there somewhere i read there that we need a farmer three times a day 
right? <laughs> breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, it's well, thank event. you for being here for, at this event thank today. Thank you so I, much. I hope that you get a lot of kids to talk to. We have. I've enjoyed, I enjoy talking to our future farmers. Good. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, and I'm here with Mike Holman here at Discovery Park of America. Welcome. Glad to be here. Tell us a little bit about what you do. Uh, we are a row crop farmers, my son and I, partnership with about 2,200 acres. Uh, we have about 1,200 acres of corn, 1,000 acres of beans. We'll have, uh, we've got a, oh, probably 500 acres irrigated. And uh, that's pretty much what we're limited to is just row crop. Now, did you uh, grow up on a farm? I did. I did. As a matter of fact, I'm living within a quarter of a mile where I was raised. Oh, wow. So, uh, so I've been on that hill a long yeah, time. Yeah, that's great. And how far back in your family did, did your, your grandparents? and uncle- actually, actually, with the Department of Ag, I have a 150-year uh, uh, farm, centennial farm. Is, is that a uh, century it, they, Every farm? year... Yeah, Century Farm. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. But mine's 150 now. Wow, that's incredible. So, do you have like a little sign out front? I think I, I see those. Well, I, I don't have it out front. I, I kind of I got mine in my office. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's great. That's very cool. Um, so what, you, you are obviously busy with uh, farming all the time, and you uh, know a lot about agriculture. Um, a lot of folks listening uh, today don't know anything about agriculture. So what kind of things do you wish that people who aren't farmers knew about what farmers do? Well, we are, I, I firmly believe that this farmers these days are taking better care of the soil than they ever have. We're doing so much more no-tilling and we're keeping, uh, we're keeping topsoil where it belongs, but we're doing a better job of soil conservation than we ever have. Uh, and now I want them to understand that, and I want them to understand also uh, this myth about GMOs. They've got to understand there is absolutely zero evidence of GMOs causing any health problems at all. Yeah, we were actually yeah. just talking about that with Carol. What um, uh, for anybody who doesn't know, and, and honestly, I didn't know until not that long ago. What exactly is a GMO? Well, it's genetically modified, and, and it has a gene inside of a soybean plant that will not allow Roundup to kill it. That's all it does. It affects the seed. It doesn't affect seed anyway. Uh, but it's, it's just doing some uh, uh, different things like that, crossbreeding plants and all, and breeding genetics into them to do what we want to do. And it's 100% safe, very safe. And I think I think because people don't because people don't um, understand, I think it makes it um, easier for people to put misinformation out there. Right. There's so much, you know, everywhere you look at GMO free. Right. Well, it, it that's it doesn't mean a thing because there's no harm in GMOs at all. And uh, a bottle of ketchup uh, saw had GMO free. Well, ketchup's made with tomatoes, but there is no GMO tomatoes. Right, right. So I don't understand it. But a lot of people are terrified with it, and they just need to understand it's not going to hurt them. Yeah. You're a row crop farmer. Uh, talk a little bit. I'm, I'm uh, interested in um, the no-till uh, farming. Do you till? Do you not till? Do you till some and not till some? No, we, we do not work the ground up unless it's absolutely necessary. Uh, we've got ground that has been in continuous no-till for uh, 20 years. Wow. We hadn't worked it up that long. And it seems that it's just getting more and more productive. Yeah. Uh, it's, and it's saving the, saving the erosion. Uh, we're not... Uh, we used to build these soil retention dams that would catch the silt, and now that's just about come to a halt because you're not catching any silt. And uh, they're not working like they used and to. And what, what uh, would they have done in the past when they were tilling? What what was the purpose? And Well, it was just a place where catch the water, let it slow down and drop the sediments before it runs out of pipe. And they were filling up. And, and there's some dams on the farm now that are filled up uh, above the pipe. But uh, it's not happening anymore. We're not, we're not, we're not we're taking better care of our soil. Well, you've seen, you've seen a lot in, in uh, your time as a farmer. What what are the most, uh, the biggest changes that you've seen in agriculture? Well, I, you know, go back to the no-till. We used to, man, we used to uh, 
disc and chisel, break, and we'll just wear the ground out and plant it. And now we can plant more in a day than we used to wow. uh, plant in, in, in a month uh, back when I was raised. And it's just the size of the farms are, are so much bigger than they used to be, and that's a trend that's going to continue. Uh, the big is going to get bigger. Uh, small farms are, are going to struggle, I believe. But uh, that's a big, one of the biggest changes. Yeah. What about harvesting? Are, are there been changes? I know, like if, if in cotton, obviously, the changes have been pretty significant in the last 75 yeah. years. Yep. Uh, harvesting, uh, it's probably my favorite time of the year. Uh, love running a combine. And there again, combines these days are, are so, such, have such a high capacity that we can haul more grain in a, in a day than we used to huh? in, in several days. Uh, we run a 12-row header. I was raised on a two-row wow. header. And uh, corn header used to cost $500 a row to buy a corn header, and now it's $10,000 a row. Man. So everything has changed. Yeah. And, and, and uh, even the elevators are having to change to accommodate such a enormous amount of corn coming in at one time. They're all coming in on, in semi-loads and not bob truck loads like you used to. And probably, I'm assuming that the uh, business aspects of farming has changed pretty much since your grandfather was doing it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, it, it has. There, you certainly have to have a business mind to stay in business this year of farming. Uh, we just, you know, we've got marketing firms that we do business with. Uh, to help market our grain, and they've been very good. Uh, all this precision ag, yeah. that is uh, something that has come up, and, and it's amazing what all it, that will and, do. And for anybody who doesn't know exactly what that is, what is precision ag? Uh, it does everything from uh, our combines have yield monitors on it that, that are constantly uh, retrieving yield data, and when you're through, you can look back at a map and show you what you know where your weak places are in the field, where your strong places are, uh, yield wise, and and uh, where they fertilizing. We'll soil sample every three acres grids, and then look at the soil test results, and it'll show where weak places are, and that's where we will only apply fertilizer is where the weak places are. Wow, and. and uh, where the strong places are, we, we may not put any or very little. There's a lot of science and technology now in agriculture. Oh, yeah, very much, very much. Very interesting, too. And it's hard for older people like myself to keep <laughs> up with uh, with how to do that. But uh, we're lucky to have a, a son, a young man that uh, can take that. Oh, that's good. And, uh, and help me unravel some of the messes I get in. Yeah. <laughs> well, a lot of these young folks today that are here learning about agriculture, it's good that uh, folks like you are preparing the next generation. Yep. What do you think? Yep. What do you think agriculture? How is it going to look different twenty years from now? Oh, you know, I, I I've thought about it and thought about it, and I just cannot answer that. I know the farms will get bigger. Uh, I firmly believe that, and there will be fewer farmers. Uh, but technology you know they've got tractors that don't need a driver now that they're trying out and perhaps that'll be a something different i'm not sure that it'll ever work around here but there will be changes i know yeah. that. well we have a lot to look forward to thank yeah, you so much for doing this today all righty i'm glad to do it so i've got mike brundage here with me today in the flesh welcome mike glad to be here so tell me a little bit about what you do in agriculture well, I am a farmer. Uh, I have two sons that farm with me in Weekly County, a little bit in Obine. Uh, we do about 3,800 acres, corn, wheat, and beans. Uh, used to be in the hog business. Everybody used to have a little livestock, but now we're all grain. Uh, have spent a lifetime here growing food and fiber in did our you, area. Did you uh, grow up on a farm? I did. Same same neighborhood, same farm? Right. Same Same place. I live two houses down from where I started. Wow. Uh, on the family farm and actually even some that has been in the family for uh, five generations. So uh, you've seen a lot in your uh, years 
what what's the good and the bad of farming? <laughs> well, the good uh, for my from my standpoint uh, was raising our family on the farm. Uh, a lot of positives there can teach children a lot of things that they're just not going to learn in other aspects of life or or not on the farm or out with livestock and plants and uh, so we really enjoyed we have three children and and we really enjoyed the fact that they were able to grow up there uh, and it has been just a uh, stable life uh, probably more questions now about uh, whether you're in or whether you're out or what's going on but for most of the time we knew what we were doing and what we had to do and uh, didn't make a lot of money but we did uh, we had a good life and so uh, through the years agriculture has had ups and downs there have been times when um, things I'm sure were tougher the weather the uh, what advice do you give to young farmers today well you know, it's a little different for a young farmer starting today. And when I started, this I just finished my 45th crop. And when wow. I started, you know, you might have a bad year, but a bad year wasn't probably going to put you out of business. And now that could happen. Also, though, now we have some risk management situations that we didn't used to have, didn't, didn't used to have crop insurance or or other marketing methods to sort of protect yourself. Of course, we've never had real protection from the weather other than maybe the irrigation systems that are up, but that's not a guarantee. But uh, the ups and downs now are a little tougher, but I think that the people, the young people that are going into farming are probably a little better prepared. Uh, Most of them are college educated or at least have gone through some training that gets them a little more prepared for uh, what they're trying to do and actually a farmer starting today there's probably a 98 percent chance that he's coming from a farm family that uh, has survived through the 80s and survived through this time so he's had that background to get him prepared or her prepared for what they're fixing to do and how about your family you mentioned did did all of your children follow in your footsteps uh my two boys are i have a daughter that uh, is not still in town and works away, but uh, the boys did. I stay, you know, my father and grandfather, I farmed with them, and then my father lived long enough to see my children farm. Wow. He didn't really get to farm with them, yeah. but he could ride the four-wheeler around and watch them. Yeah, so, uh, that's great. That uh, That's a real plus, and uh, I think that we are in a succession plan now for it to continue. Each of them... Uh, they have a boy apiece, so that oh. might continue. <laughs> we don't know. Yeah. One, of, one of them has four daughters, and we don't know what that'll, <laughs> where that'll lead. Well, you know, there's a lot of uh, young ladies here uh, today, so maybe some of them will be farmers as well. That's exactly right. That's great. Well, thank you for being here and sharing with us today. This is re- really uh, a lot of fun having you guys here. We certainly appreciate the efforts that y'all are doing and putting some ag news out there, and hopefully your new... Uh, direction is going to be good and we're certainly hoping that we can help you with it. Sounds fantastic. Thank you. Uh Uh-huh. I'm here with Brenda Baker. Welcome, Brenda. Thank you for having me. So tell me a little bit about what you do in the big, big world of agriculture. Well, I'm a farmer's wife, uh, mother of four, grandmother of seven. We farm about 3,000 acres uh, at Obine, corn and soybeans. But in the past, we've raised hogs, farrow to finish. We've raised a little bit of cotton, some wheat. Uh, We had 20,000 breeder hens for Tyson. So I gathered eggs for 13 years. So we've had cattle and and done a little bit of everything. So what what, uh, did you grow up? As a, were you a farmer's daughter as well? Did you grow up on a farm? Uh, well, I was a farmer's daughter, but I did not grow up on the farm. So uh, I told somebody not long ago, I was a city girl who came off of sidewalks and roller skates and, and uh, walked into the movie theater and uh, fell in love with my farm boy. Ah. So I... And where, where did you grow up? Uh, part of the time I was in Michigan. Okay. Uh, my, my, my parents were... Uh, part of that southern migration that that went north uh-huh. uh, 
I have an older sister who is deaf, and that's the reason that they went north was oh. was to put her in school. So, uh, but uh, there was a lot of back and forth. This was always home. My parents were both born here. Okay. And uh, but when you marry a farm boy. You marry the farm. Yep. Now, now, did your husband already, when you got married, have land? and? Yes. Uh, as far back as we can trace his family, they have been farmers. And, and so I laugh and say, I, I think farmers don't have blood. They have dirt in their veins. <laughs> and and uh, we have a son who uh, that's all he's ever wanted to do. So about six years ago, he came back to the farm. So uh, right now, my husband and my son, and my brother-in-law are, are all farming together. And, what, uh, what uh, if if you go back to when you got married? What are the changes that you've seen oh. in agriculture? <laughs> I, I I wrote that down not long ago. When my job when when we first got married, uh, we handled everything by hand. So all the seed corn was in a bag, all the fertilizer was in a bag. And my job was to be on the back of the truck and drag those bags so that Sam didn't have to, to get up on the truck every time and, and get it down. And now they have the, the big seed wagons and they spread the fertilizer with huge big trucks. And, and uh, we have tractors and combines with auto steer and, and uh, use semis instead of uh, uh, that haul a thousand uh, bushels of grain instead of a little truck that hauls 300 bushels of grain. It is entirely different. He plowed and disc and and now we do conservation or no-till and and uh, uh, the the changes uh, just been about as uh, drastic as going to the moon. Uh, <laughs> my the favorite thing that I like to tell kids is that uh, when I go to school, uh, especially for career day or something like that, when when I We'll take the combine, uh, we'll take the tractor or, or the sprayer or whatever, that the tractor has more computing power in it than the first space shuttle. Wow, that's amazing. And so that's how much things have changed. Um, and you're, uh, you've been a very big advocate in your career for farmers and farming and agriculture. Um, what, do you th- what do you think, you know, regular folks who don't even know where their food comes from, what kind of things do you think they need to know about agriculture? They need to know that farmers are producing more with less uh, every year. Uh, and and, and Obine County is a good example. Look at the roads we're building. So those roads will never produce food again. And uh, we need them desperately. Don't say we don't, but, but farmers are producing more with less. They're being very good stewards of the land. Uh, taking care of it because there's not any more land out there, not any more dirt out there. Uh, The product that we're producing is safe, and our family eats it first, so we're not going to produce something that that is not safe for your family to to eat. I I think uh, people now have an idea that it's big corporate farms. Uh, that that businesses own them. 98% of all the farms in the United States are family owned. I know we're farming lots more acres than we used to, but we're still a family operation. And and uh, um, I just want them to know that that uh, I want them to get to know their farmer, make a connection with the land again. Uh, we're about four generations removed from the farm. Most most families don't even have a grandparent to go back and visit. That's right. And so they just don't understand the whole process. Uh, they may see something that they don't understand, but that may be a um, standard operating procedure for, for the farmers. Uh, so instead of misunderstanding or, or believing what's on Facebook or something that they might read, ask a farmer. Uh, they'll be glad to tell you. Most of them will invite you to their farm and, and uh, uh, show you around and explain what's going on that you don't understand. Yeah, that's great. What advice would you give someone who was considering marrying a farmer or becoming a farmer themselves? a lot of women farmers. Though. There sure are a lot more now than, than used to be. Uh, uh, and and 
I, I admire these young ladies that are that are uh, out there and and not inheriting the farm but starting their their own business. My advice is. Like I said, when you marry the farm, uh, marry the farmer, you marry the farm. Uh, it, it, it's not always easy. There, most people don't realize what an investment farmers have in it. Uh, most jobs you go to, all you've got invested is your time, maybe your car to get there. Uh, but but you, you're not invested in the infrastructure. We are, most of us live in the middle of our occupation mm -hmm. and uh, we're surrounded by the work that we do. It's usually a seven day a week job. Mm -hmm. um, and and it seems to me just from a distance that it's a, 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 at times it's almost 24 hours a day because I see people on Facebook you know, they're working in the field and it's dark outside. And, you know, Sunday afternoon when people are watching football games, I'm seeing people in combines. Uh, planting and harvest, very intense. And, and you do what has to be done to, uh, to take care of the crop uh, because weather is not always your friend. Mm -hmm. and, and so farmers have to consider lots of things, weather included. And, and uh, um, it's just a big commitment. And if you don't work together, uh, you're not going to be real happy. Yeah. But uh, uh, it's one of the best lives. I, we raised four children on the farm. Wouldn't take anything for it. Now, are uh, all four of them in agriculture? Or no. Just, just, well, one is, and one is teaching about agriculture. Oh, okay. Uh, our son, uh, like I say, uh, came back to the farm about, about six years ago, and uh, we have a daughter who's teaching ag in the classroom oh, great. in Georgia, and, uh, but oldest daughter is a, is a registered nurse, and the other daughter is a teacher. So, oh, fantastic. Uh, uh, they all live around here? No, one's in Memphis and one's in Georgia. And how then many two grandchildren did you say? Yeah, seven grandchildren. Oh, man. And they're, they're spread from uh, Norfolk, Virginia to, to Georgia. Got one precious little great-granddaughter. Oh, my goodness. Yes. That's crazy. Yes. Well, they've all got a farm to come back to, thanks they to, do. to you guys. And they do come back. And, and it, it makes good memories. And the uh, little ones like to go to the garden and help their papa. And, and so they have that connection. Uh, we share... Uh, garden things with with the family uh, all during the summer, and uh, we sent lots of cucumbers and squash to Memphis this year. Yeah, both and, my grandparents were farmers, and um, so I got to go from Memphis back to Haywood yeah. County and and I hang out on their farms. And I remember uh, every year when they would make a stew, that they would take the vegetables right yeah. out of of the garden. The garden. Yes. My grandmother's recipe for stew. Um, says something like boil six chickens. So it's <laughs> <laughs> so uh, well, at some point I'm going to try to you know l lower the quantity. Definitely, but but so many families don't have that connection, mm -hmm. and so they don't understand what they see. There's so much misinformation out there now. Um, people trying to um, I, I don't say spread misinformation, but they don't understand and. And it, it makes it hard on us, uh, and it makes them afraid, and we don't want them to be afraid of what they eat. America has the most abundant and the cheapest food of any country in the whole world. Yeah. And, um, well, um, and, and a lot of people, not only are they removed, a lot of people are living in areas in metropolitan communities mm -hmm. where they don't even have you know, access to food as much as some of us do. So that's, that's the truth. Uh, it's really important, I think, for everybody to learn, you know, more about where our food comes from, not just as, as a, a country, but as a world. That's you right. Know, the global, the, the uh, global impact of agriculture is significant. It, it, it is. Uh, so, so much of our food, American farmers produce more than we can use. And so much of ours is exported. And uh, um, we're trying to get more school gardens uh, into schools or community gardens going, uh, just so people will have that connection and will be able to see something grow. It always tastes better when you've grown it yourself. I was just going to say that. It's always, <laughs> it's always different. 
I can still think of the smell of my grandfather's back porch when the tomatoes came in and he mm-hmm. was sitting them up there or the watermelons. Yes. You know, there's a certain odor that I think there of immediately is. that a lot of people don't get to experience. So there is. we want to make sure everybody gets to experience That's true. That. That's true. Well, thank you for all the work that you're doing for agriculture and representing this, this community. Thank you. I think it's important and uh, I'd like to share with, with other people, be glad to talk to anybody uh, about it and uh, I go to school in fact I'm going to school next week and and read to the kids and the very first thing I always say when I go into a classroom do I look like a farmer <laughs> and they always say no that's right. and I say but I am that's right yeah that's great that's wonderful well, thank you thank you so much so I got Matt Fiddle here with me welcome Matt Good to see you. Great to be here. So tell me a little bit about what you do in the world of agriculture. Okay. Well, I'm a regional field director for Tennessee Farm Bureau Federation. So uh, working in this West Tennessee area, I'm sort of the liaison for 13 of our county Farm Bureau boards uh, between the county Farm Bureau board and then the uh, state federation. And so pretty much uh, being in the breadbasket of Tennessee, I probably have the most productive agricultural counties that I work in here, so uh, there's just not a whole lot going on agriculturally in this area that I'm probably not involved with or engaged with or at least somewhat held responsible for knowing about. So what's your what's your day, what are your days like? Uh, they vary, so uh, we do a lot of work through our agriculture in the classroom program, so this week being uh, Tennessee Ag Literacy Week, I've spent some time in some schools. Uh, yesterday, I was up at South Fulton Elementary School with some kids and one of our young farmers. Uh, we're talking to uh, a class uh, about agriculture and showing them our cool virtual reality goggles and did a virtual tour of a farm. Did you bring those uh, yes, today? Yeah, yes. I want to go over there and check yeah, that out. Yeah, they're, uh, they're pretty exciting. Uh, they're hard to... Not hard to spot. It's where you see kids looking all around, up and down, and walking aimlessly with goggles on their heads. So, <laughs> uh, then it, it, our days vary. You know, we we set up a lot of meetings. Uh, we get engaged with our lawmakers quite a bit. Help uh, help sort of connect our farmer members to uh, to the political system. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking about. Uh, state and federal issues, uh, looking at policy, things that we need to work on in the legislature. And then, uh, of course, we have some full-time lobbyists in D.C. and Nashville, but we sort of bring issues from the farm level to those guys that they need to talk about. So let's, um, because I I want to talk about some of those issues, uh, but first, let's go back to your childhood. Were you actually raised on a farm? Yes, sir. I was raised right here in Obion County, uh, primarily a a swine operation at the time. Uh, We had a little bit of row crop and a few cattle, but uh, my passion was always in swine production, uh, growing up uh, through elementary school and even into high school. Uh, And then, of course, the, uh, the swine market sort of went south there in the the mid to late 90s as I was going into college and uh, always thought that I'd be able to come back to the farm to raise hogs, but as it turned out, that part didn't work out. So uh, went into a career as an insurance agent for the Farm Bureau and uh, about eight years ago transferred from that role into uh, into working on the organization side. And that's probably something a lot of people don't realize is you can work in farming and agriculture with without even actually working on a farm. Absolutely, absolutely. There's so many jobs that are available right now. Uh, our industry is growing at such a rapid pace. Uh, you know, the challenge to feed nine to ten billion people in the next 25 to 30 years has really uh, got a lot of our ag business companies ramping up production. You've got a lot of neat things in the pipeline. Uh, They're looking for the best and brightest, uh, scientists, engineers, chemists. uh, There are jobs uh, for just about anyone in an agriculture, in the ag field, there are jobs for just about anyone, regardless of of what their passion is. And even on the environment side, natural uh, resource-oriented things, and I know you've got some of those representatives here today. uh, For for whatever a a young person is interested in, there's probably a field that uh, they can find that in agriculture. Well, there's, there's, um, I've found there's a big discrepancy between the knowledge that people in agriculture have and people who are just regular folks eating food. What are some of the things that you think some, some of who may be listening now, regular folks need to know about agriculture and where our food, fuel, and fiber comes from? I think the most important thing is that, that the food and the products that you buy and you see in the grocery stores 
it's important to know that the farmers that are raising and growing those are feeding them to their children. Uh, it's, it's very safe. Uh, in this country, we have the safest, most abundant food supply and the most affordable food supply of anywhere in the world. Uh, the United States Department of Agriculture has uh, had inspectors uh, for many, many years throughout all over the country. Our meat plants where all of our food stuff is processed and purchased. Uh, everything goes through so many different layers and levels of oversight and inspections. It's just unlikely to ever uh, to ever feel that anything you're buying is going, is going to harm you or your children. It's been through so many tests. Uh, there's lots of issues around genetically modified organisms now and GMOs. Uh, a GMO is just is something as simple as finding a trait that's very favorable. For instance, uh, a stalk of corn that puts on three years instead of two and finding what, makes, uh, what part of the DNA makes that happen and replicating that into other plants. It's that yeah, I think simple. We were talking earlier with someone else. I think people don't understand what GMO means and when you see at the grocery store you see all these labels that say no GMO then that automatically if you don't know that sends a signal that a GMO is a bad thing right right and so people don't understand that generations of people you yeah. know have been genetically modifying that's right you know that's so. right it's just the it's it's natural evolution maybe sped up a little bit what are some of the ways um, that you're working to educate the public on issues relating to agriculture? Well, uh, Tennessee Farm Bureau, we have several programs. Our Ag in the Classroom program is uh, probably one of the most uh, visible that is out. Uh, we do teacher workshops through the summer. We have curriculum uh, that's available through our home office in Columbia that teachers can actually take those lesson plans uh, that are already there and put them into the classroom and, and teach certain science standards. Uh, we work with a lot of other uh, organizations and commodity groups throughout the state. Um, and we just, you know, we try to, uh, to promote a positive image where we can and uh, let people know that we got a safe, abundant food supply. So the, the knowledge that the public may or may not have is one challenge. What are the other challenges facing the agriculture industry in the, in the present and in the future? I think a uh, big challenge, uh, the knowledge is probably, probably the biggest, uh, just simply fact folks understanding what is going on. But uh, what I guess closely follows that is, uh, in my opinion, state and federal legislation. Uh, lots of laws get passed that have unintended consequences that, uh, that our farmers and landowners suffer from. You know, uh, a city council can be meeting here across town and, and think of something that would be really, really great for the people of the town and the city, but then they don't think about the consequences of maybe it's related to traffic control. They don't think about the fact that so many goods and services and agricultural products have to travel the same roads or maybe come through the same area. So uh, just a whole lot. I don't believe that people are malicious in nature. I think it's just the, the, the lack of understanding that creates unintended consequences. And we're seeing that at the federal level a lot too. Uh, we, we do seem to have a pretty friendly ag administration now and that's one of the things that uh, I think has made, uh, made the current administration popular uh, in agriculture and in rural America is because of uh, taking time to, to look and reverse some of those unintended consequences and take laws off the books that yeah that maybe were curtailing some things yeah, in the past. Yeah, interesting. What, what about long-term? What are some of the challenges that you see? Um, and maybe another way to ask that is, what does agriculture look like 20 years from now? Uh, you know, that is hard to imagine, what it looks like 20 years from now. There are already so many things in the pipeline. Uh, you know, the autonomous tractors, uh, that, that essentially where someone is sitting at a computer, maybe driving their tractor. Uh, the, the, the fun thing that's happening is how environmentally friendly agriculture is going to continue to be because whenever, you know, we used to farm farms by the field and now we're farming by the square foot. Uh, we're not putting any nutrients, we're not doing anything to the soil that, that, that is not needed now, uh, literally down to the square foot. We're used to you throw all of the product out of an average of the field now you can look at, at a square foot and decide what that needs. And, and the, uh, the autonomous tractors, you know, they're, 
they're going to be to the point where you may want to just work in a few spots of the field. You program that in, and it won't disturb the soil in areas where it don't need disturbing, but uh, it will will uh, get the soil ready for planting in areas that maybe have been disturbed by uh, uh, an animal or something like that, you know. Wow, it's amazing. Um, any uh, words of advice or suggestion to anybody who might be considering exploring opportunities in the world of agriculture? Oh, yeah, I think just uh, just keep an open mind and uh, look for ways that any of your your interest and your talents can, can fit into to our industry. Uh, we're going to need economists. We're going to need uh, financial experts. We're going to need scientists. Communicators. Uh, communicators. Uh, you know, there's there's pretty much a place for everyone. It's a growing industry and a growing field. Yeah, well, thanks for all you do, and thanks for being here today. Well, thank you all for having us. This is, uh, I think this is an awesome opportunity. Really excited. I really love the buzz and the feel that's, that's in the air here today. Yeah, it's good. It's real good. Thanks a lot. You bet. Thank you. So I got Rusty Grills with me today. Welcome. Thank you for having me. So you're a uh, ninth generation farmer, you were telling me? That's correct. Uh, my brothers and I, I actually, I live down, down the road in Newburn. We have a family farm down there, a farm with my dad and two brothers, Hunter and Cody. And, uh, and yeah, we've, we've been, uh, been farming for a long time. My brother, of- my brother did all the research, or, or he had a guy do some of the research a yeah. few years back. And it was kind of... Wow, eye-opening. And not to mention, uh, you know, we've got, I've got two little girls, and if we can talk them into farming. <laughs> That's right. And you never know what, yeah. may, what may transpire. So A lot uh, of young ladies here today, yes, so maybe yes. we'll have some farmers come out of these folks today. I hope so, hope so. Um, so um, what kind of uh, farming, tell me a little bit about your farm. Well, primarily with row crops, uh, so, uh, corn, soybeans. We raise some uh, triticale. It's kind of like a wheat, uh, mm-hmm. just it's mainly for, for seed stock. We have some cattle. We've had hogs in the past, but uh, there's a, I don't know, uh, just uh, not not something we have now. Yeah. Uh, we've, we've actually considered, you know, maybe putting in one of the barns that the Tosh Farms uses, but uh, that's just not, uh, not, not on our radar right now. Yeah. What's the uh, best thing about farming? What's the best thing about farming? Oh, uh, without a doubt, it's the quality time you get to spend with your family. Um, you know, I have two brothers. We're fantastic friends you know every now and then they don't listen to me and we have to, I have to straighten them out but <laughs> but uh you know you get to you get to work with your uh, your family you get to spend time with your wife uh, you know i know uh, in the fall and in the spring it's hectic uh we're always uh, on the run it seems but you get to you get to uh, get on a tractor and and uh, just talk about the things that the wife come out there and get on a tractor and you just talk about the day and your kids get on a tractor just for 15 20 minutes and just it's just relaxing and uh you know, I've had uh, different friends from across the country. You know, they have to go to Thanksgiving or Christmas to see their family and get to spend a little time with them. And I get to do that every day. So I'm very fortunate to have that. Um, now, you recently decided to start serving public office. Well, actually, I, I ran for county commission in 2010. Okay. And okay. I, I still serve in that capacity right now there okay. in Dyer County. Uh, I've been elected three times to that position. And uh, obviously, when Mr. Sanderson resigned, uh, there was an opportunity to run. So I ran in uh, the recent uh, primary election, and we were successful. And won the, when that election had uh, three other opponents, but uh, we were we were the victors. And very humbling, yeah, very eye-opening. And uh, you know, it's just an opportunity to uh, get to represent the good folks here in District 77. And, w- and uh, why do you think that's important? Why do I think it's important? Because agriculture is the number one industry in this area and who better to represent this area than someone who is a full-time farmer yep and and i really believe that Uh, you know people are getting so removed from agriculture and and the importance that uh, and the importance of agriculture and uh you know what what this uh, this country was founded upon you know judeo-christian values and the farming community still embraces so many of those and i believe those values and that lifestyle is something that we ought to embrace. But not only that, the the the, fa- the farm that I uh, am part of, we get to live that out every day. You know, we can help our neighbors. Uh, we can, uh, you know, be an assistance to those that are in need. Uh, you know, you you got a neighbor over there that's uh, needs a needs a tire changed. It's not a not a problem for us as a farmer to run by with a service truck, throw a jack under it, impact gun, and in two minutes you've got their tire changed. For some, you know, it may have taken them. 
an hour to get it done. You know, just just little things like that. As a as a farmer and as someone who represents farmers, what do you think are the biggest challenges for the agriculture community in the next few years? You know, you, you hear everyone has different opinions of that. And you know, I, I saw some things this morning uh, on the on the internet that I was reading. Uh, I watched a little video. It talked about uh, three people. It was a it was a child, his parents, and their, their grandparents, and talked about how they uh, their life had changed from when the grandparent grew up to the parent had grown up to the child had grown up. The the parent and the child both had spent. I mean, I'm sorry. The parent and the grandparent had both spent their childhood outside playing and enjoying the outdoors and doing different things with the community. Now, the uh, the children they said they could spend all day in their room playing video games. Mm-hmm. And I believe the I believe the interaction, and not just uh, not just in the agriculture community, but the interaction of, in civilization all together, is we spend so much time on electronics. And maybe that's just something that's on my heart today. But we spend so much time on electronics playing and satisfying our cravings rather than thinking about the neighbor or the person across the table from us. And, and what are they going through? You know, being that person that actually can, cares and is concerned about someone else. And, and I believe we need to get back to those types of thought processes. And I believe, uh, I believe that's the reason people like the country, the country living because they actually appreciate their neighbor yeah. more so than other places yeah at least that's some of the perception yeah well uh thank you for uh serving uh yes. the community and representing all of us here in this district well thank you much um, of course if any of us at discovery park can help you in any way let us know well uh you know i'm sure that uh, i'm sure we'll be seeing each other in the future actually i believe you got something going on next weekend for some farmers yep yep absolutely yeah. there's, there's always something going on yeah. around here yeah. so. well I, I think i'm going to be up here for that look forward to that and uh uh, yeah, but you know, y'all have done so much here. Uh, when I pulled up, I said, "My goodness, look at all the folks here." Yeah, it's, and, a, it's a busy day today. It is, and yeah. uh, and you know, people need to take up, uh, take every advantage of every opportunity they have to come up here and and just enjoy it. Not to mention, it's rainy outside and it's warm and nice That's right. and cozy, That's right. and plenty of space to run around. That's right. We're having a good time. Well, thank you for being thank here. Thank you so much. And now I have Misha Matting here, who obviously is from Nutrient Ag Solutions. Welcome, Misha. Um, tell me a little bit about what you do. Thank you. So I am a precision ag specialist for Nutrient Ag Solutions um, in my division. Our division is Tennessee, Western Kentucky. So um, what that entails is all things precision for all of our locations. Um, a big part of it is our new precision program that we are now offering to all Nutrient customers. Um, it's NutriCrop Solutions. And that is a, um, it's a precision program to where we offer variable rate fertility scripts, variable rate seeding, all that kind of things for our growers. Um, and so let's back up a little bit. How did you grow? Did you grow up on a farm or in the city? Or? I did not. I actually grew up close to Mayfield, Kentucky. Um, I did not grow up on a farm. When I was in high school, I worked at our local uh, farm supply store, Falders. And uh, so I came to know and love all the growers in our area that way and kind of fell in love with it and went from there. And I went on to Murray State University and got a degree in ag business. Oh, wow. So uh, for someone out there who's listening who doesn't know much about ag business, what, what uh, type of things can someone who majors in ag business think, think about doing with their life? So ag business is a very, um, it's a very broad degree, I guess you would say. Um, it doesn't necessarily specialize in agronomy or, or ag systems or anything like that. So I took classes in Um, a little bit of everything to get a big picture. I got um, classes in weed science, agronomy, soil science, as well as the finance side of things as well. So uh, now we can fast forward to today. What um, type of things do you do in your career today? So today, um, we Nutrien recently acquired another ag retailer, Security Seed, um, which is a local retailer. And so um, with that came the precision program that they offered for their growers, which at the time was Secure Crop. And so now we are rebranding that to NutriCrop and offering that to our growers. So I've been doing a lot of training and learning a lot, um, uh, learning the the software that they use in the platforms and the different kinds of technology that they integrate to get all that done. So do you spend a lot of time with farmers actually in the field? Uh, Sometimes. It depends on what I'm doing. So days like today, I'm, I'm spending time out here doing um, things with the public, getting and to know these kiddos. Fun, isn't it, it is. It's fun. It's yeah. been a good day. Yeah, they're having fun. Yeah. So, um, not quite as much time with with the growers as a, as a salesman or you know somebody in that capacity would, but um, 
yeah, meeting with growers about what needs they have um, as far as their precision, uh, what, how they're implementing that on their farm and what we can do to make it better, how we can use um, the data from their farm to make better decisions. And so a lot of folks listening to this aren't farmers themselves and don't know a whole lot about agriculture. Talk a little bit about what precision agriculture actually is. So preci- precision agriculture, I guess, um, my definition would be just taking all of the technology that we, ha- we do have available and using it to make better data-driven decisions on the farm. So, um, you know, combines going through the field at this point, we're, we've got yield data coming in that we're cleaning and, and we're using that historical data to go move forward and make better decisions. So picking out the uh, highly productive areas in the field and the areas where you might be losing money year over year, um, pointing that out to the grower to make, to make better decisions, figure out where we're going to spend more of our fertility budget, where we might cut back a little bit, things so like people that. So who, people who uh, think that farming is just planting seeds and, you know, then, then harvesting the They don't understand all the technology and, and everything that goes into it today. Right, right. There's a, there's a whole lot more behind the scenes that goes on that, that you wouldn't really even think would, would play into it. And so um, what, what do you feel like, because you're, I'm sure you read um, agriculture magazines and you're right in the, what uh-huh. do you think are the biggest challenges for the agriculture community going forward? Uh, biggest challenges that, that I'm, you know, that I face um, in what I do um, is being able to have everything in one spot. So you have all of these different platforms. We've got Climate, we've got My John Deere, we've got, you know, all these places that growers can keep their data and their information all these different people that they can go to for advice and for recommendations and providing them with a way to have that all in one place. Um, so that's that's what we try to do at Nutrien. We try to give them a one-stop shop. You know, they can get all of their supplies from us um, and then we offer the services to go along with it as well. So with the precision program that we offer, for example, we give them access to all of their data. It's a place that they can go in and see all of their historical data um, and then see all of their recommendations that we're making for them and, and manage their data more easily. For folks out there who are trying to decide whether or not they want to, or what per career they want to pursue, what, what, what do you feel like are the fun things about agriculture? Um, I, I do love dealing with the growers. I love, I love getting to build those relationships, meeting them, and you know, getting to the point to where you can stop by their shop on the way home and, and you know, answer any questions that they may have or just talk about whatever. Um, but I also enjoy the fact that, um, you know, with precision agriculture, technology is always changing, just like it is in any other field. Agriculture is not the only field that, that uses technology. So it's always changing, and it's a challenge to keep up with what's new and what our new, new um, opportunities are and make sure we're covering our bases, make sure we're not missing anything. So uh, no two days in my, in my life look the same, I guess. What do you, what do you think uh – agriculture and farming is going to look like 20 years from now oh gosh 20 years from now um well they've already got a tractor that you don't even have to have there's not even a cab on it there's not a you know nobody's driving it so i can't imagine in 20 years what it's going to look like but um i think the data is going to come into play a lot more i think people are just now kind of realizing the importance of taking your historical data and the data the data that we have locally the research that's been done and using that to make better decisions so You know, for example, variable rate in your seed population, there are people, there are growers that are just now getting into that. Um, Corn mainly is the one that we're variable rating. So, you you know, you plant thinner on your bad ground, thicker on your good ground, and then beans, it's it's just the opposite, you know. And we don't have anybody yet that's variable rating on beans for the most part. So things like that are where I I see advancement is, um, I guess, realization of the need for precision agriculture. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being here, sharing with all these kids. I've been talking to some of them. They're having a good time. (laughs) I'm glad. It's it's been a good day. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, good. Well, thanks a lot. Thank you. And now let's go find out a little bit more behind the scenes at Discovery Park of America. Hello, I am Katie Jarvis, and in the studio today at Discovery Park of America, I've got John Watkins, who is our grounds director here. John, thank you for coming today. Well, you're very welcome. Got me out of the cold for a few minutes. Oh, it is very cold today. So you are the Christmas guru. You are in charge of the lights and making Discovery Park of America dance and twinkle and dazzle just in time for Christmas. So we want to know the behind the scenes. We want to take a peek behind the curtain and just hear what it takes to put on this great Christmas light show. Well, we're going into, what, our sixth year now? 
So we have accumulated uh, quite a few lights. We are over a million lights Woo-hoo! now. I know we hit that mark last year. Uh, so we've gone a little bit over that, but uh, we like to say that we do now actually have over a million lights. And that being said, uh, it takes a while to put those up, to put a million lights up. Uh, we generally start in late September or early October. Uh, you'll see us out there in short pants and short sleeves and burning hot weather. And up until days like today when the high temperature I think the wind chill when I walked in a few minutes ago was eight degrees, Ooh. so it's not too pleasant out. But it's always a great show, and we look forward to it every year. Um, but it's a, it's a work of love, I guess. Mm-hmm. So tell us, you were telling me earlier before we started recording about how many miles of lights or how many miles of extension cords. Well, if we strung all of our lights out, all of our strings together, uh, we have close to now about twelve to fourteen miles. Of lights. Wow. So, yes, we could stretch from uh, Union City to Martin almost and, and make a solid strand of light. <laughs> uh, bigger than that is trying to get electricity to all this. We don't have electricity throughout a lot of the grounds and, of course, not up in the trees where we put all these lights. Mm-hmm. So we hook together and make our own and, and buy about six miles of extension cords uh, to get electricity to everything. So 20 miles in total. Around. around 20 miles in total. <laughs> wow. So it's a real treat for all of our guests that come out each year and drive through the thousands, excuse me, million, mm. over a million lights <laughs> um, here at Discovery Park and throughout the grounds. And y'all do a great job. How many people do you have on your team that put these lights up? Oh, we've got a pretty diverse crew. My grounds crew, uh, we've probably got four to five people putting up lights, but there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. Our IT department puts together a lot of the synchronized lights, so you'll see a lot of the lights when you drive through are synchronized to our own radio station that we broadcast. So uh, it, it gives it a little bit extra something to uh, to listen to and be able to hear and see at the same time. But our IT department comes up with some fantastic ideas, and they make these things. We'll have dancing hoops. We'll have stars up in the trees. We'll have uh, synchronized uh, light shows on the ground and above up in the air. Wow. And have y'all, I know that y'all um, introduce new things every year. And should we expect that? There's for the always years something. To come? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> we try and come up with a few new things. Uh, we uh, rack our brains and, and try and do something that stays current. There's so much technology now that every year it seems like there's something new that comes out. So we'll use a lot of RGB lights that are able to produce. Uh, an infinite number of colors. Uh, so we may get as many as, what, 256 different colors out of one bulb. Wow. And you string several thousand of those together, you'll have like a million different combinations to go through. But we do try and keep up with the technology and, and make it interesting. Things that you won't be able to, you know, you can't just dig around in your attic and pull out the lights and throw them up outside. These are things that you probably won't see anywhere else. Yeah. This year we have built a new tunnel. Oh, yes. Everyone so, talks about the tunnel. Uh, the tunnels are so much fun. They're set up and synchronized. Uh, some of them are set up to the music. A lot of them uh, produce lights, waves that go back and forth. So as you're driving through, you really have to pay attention to the road. I've noticed several cars uh, veering over towards the lights, and it always makes me nervous, but uh, everything tends to work out, and it's a great show. If somebody wanted to start their own Christmas light show, could they do it? Uh, The biggest thing, we use uh, all LED lights uh, for a number of different reasons. The lights tend to last a lot longer. We're going on six years, and some of our original lights we bought six years ago uh, are still doing great. And you got to figure that we put on the show for a solid month, so it's 30 days and, and of solid lights at night, usually six to eight hours a night. That's quite a few hours to get out of a light bulb, and they tend to hold up very well. They're a little more expensive on the front end, but you get what you pay for, and if you want something that's going to last a long time, LED is definitely the way to go. Worth the investment. Well, John, thank you so much for coming out today to be a part of the Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.